Good evening. Welcome back to Tuesday night Bible study on Monday night again. Hopefully next uh, Tuesday night will be May the 21st. I will be back hopefully on uh, schedule then. Uh, my grandson's got another t-ball game tomorrow evening and I do not want to miss it. But I want God's word to get out. So let's get started. We left off at Ezekiel chapter 38. We stopped at verse 9. We're going to pick back up at verse 10 tonight, and we're going to continually breaking down this, um, which we were talking about, the beast of Revelation 17, or Revelation 16 and 17, as well as the, the beast that Daniel saw in chapter 7 of Daniel. Uh, the seven heads and the ten horns. We broke that down. We've, we're actually talking about the ten horns tonight, which we, we have come to know through Scripture that these, that these are the countries that's going to invade Israel in the last days. These are prophecy against the Gentile powers at Armageddon. Now, we're, we've actually talked about these uh, ten kingdoms and uh, their leaders, and we've also talked about uh, how we know that these are, these countries are the countries today. You can do some research and go back to Genesis chapter 10 and search all that out. Tonight, we're going to talk about Gog, and we, if you guys remember, Gog is the leader that we believe of Russia. Gog is the man. Magog is the land of Russia. And we can search that out through history of Genesis chapter 10. I hope you guys actually got to go back and look at that. So tonight we're actually going to start with Gog's, not God, Gog's, the leader of this coalition's purpose for the invasion of Israel. And verse 10 through 13 is going to tell us this. Now, as we, we get into this, we're going, to, we're going to do some history here. We're going to break some good stuff down here. The first thing I want to do is I want to, let's go ahead and read a little bit, and we'll go from there. So, again, Gog, the leader of Russia, his purpose for the invasion into the land of Israel. Now, verse 10, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall also come to pass that in the same time shall things come into thy mind. He's talking about the leader of this man named God uh, that is called Gog here, the leader of Russia. And thou shalt think an evil thought. In other words, God is going to put a thought in his head to go into Israel. Now, about, we don't know. I mean, they're, they're sitting in the sea over there right now. Could the time come that God go ahead and puts this into Gog's head? We don't know that. All I can tell you is this is end time prophecy, and I will show you how we know it's end time prophecy, okay? Now, but an evil thought will come into the leader of Russia's head. Now, this is what he's going to go in for, verse 11. And thou shalt say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. In other words, Israel is safe. They're in their country right now. They've been, think about this, prophecy was fulfilled in 1948 when Israel became a nation again. Now, plane loads of Israel's, of the Jewish people has been returning to Israel since then. God is bringing, he's bringing his people home. And we're going to see there's a couple of reasons why this is all going to unfold, okay? But they are right now, and I'm not saying this is going to happen now. Could it? Absolutely. It could happen tomorrow. We don't know. But I will say this. We know this is the end times the Bible's talking about right here. So we know they're living safely right now. They, they don't have bars and gates. We know they're, they're uh, dwelling in their land at rest. Now, verse 12. This is why... Gog and his armies, through the leadership of the Antichrist, will go into Israel. Verse 12, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have 
gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Now, right here's the reason they're going to go in for spoil. Now, is it cattle and goods? That would have been, remember, when the writer wrote this, Ezekiel, he put it in his terms or his layman terms at that time. What was the what was spoil back then? Cattle, goods, gold, silver. Today, remember, back then, Jewish men were considered rich by their livestock. Today, what is a what is a spoil or goods? Could we say oil, natural gas, uh, technologies? That would be that would be my opinion of the spoil that they would go in for today. Okay, now let's look at a couple of things here. I want to read verse 13, and we're going to break this verse down, okay? There's a lot here in this verse. So I want to take my time with it for you guys to understand it. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lines thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Ast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take away a great spoil. In other words, th this Sheba and this Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lines thereof, and I'm going to break all that down, they are not getting involved in this. They're sort of sidelining it, could we say. Um... Uh, they're asking this leader, why Why are you guys going in? What's the purpose of this? So let's break this down, okay? Verse 13. Who is Sheba and Dedan? Again, you can go back to Genesis chapter 10 and do a little research on this through the internet and figure this out for yourself. But this is modern day Saudi Arabia. Now, the merchants of Tarshish. We know Sheba and Dedan are Saudi Arabia, but who are the merchants of Tarshish? All right. This refers to a maritime and trading community that was located in Spain during the general time of King Solomon, around 3,000 years ago. Okay. But who is merchants of Tarshish today? All right. I'm going to break that down right now. The merchants of Tarshish today, well, can we say during the last 500 years, it has developed into modern mercantile nations of Western Europe like Spain, Holland, and Britain. Can we say Great Britain? Now, so the merchants of Tarshish would be, the, would be mercantile nations that's developed out of this would be like Western Europe, Spain, Holland, and Britain. Now, he also gives us here with all the young lines thereof, and some scripture says with all its villages. Now, that's simple. This refers to colonies of Western Europe and the nations that have risen from them. Now, listen to this. This would include North America and the United States. Another good example of this is what, what, what nation do we come from? We come from Britain. What is their flag? They have a lion on it. We are a young lion. We come from that nation, which is called Britain. That means we're a colony that broke off of Britain, and we are now a young lion thereof. Our country's, what, a little over 200 years old. This would include, like I said, North America and the United States. In other words, these nations right here, Sheba Dedan, merchants of Tarshish, and the young lions thereof, these nations will simply say to the leader of Russia, have you come to capture spoil? Thus, the response to the invasion will be one of non-intervention. And that's what Scripture says. That's not what Junior says. That's what Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us here. How do we know when this is going to be? 
The Bible's going to continue. We're going to go through this whole chapter and break it down. It's very vital. I'm also going to tie this chapter in with Revelation, Matthew 24. And we're going to tie a few more in there also. So I think Zechariah's going to be tied in. Micah's going to be tied in. Guys, remember, prophecy is a fine thread. Prophecy runs from Genesis to Revelation. And this fine thread that runs through, you have to keep Scripture in context. I could pull Scripture out and make it say whatever I want it to say. We are not to do that. God intends for us to study the Word, 2 Timothy 2.15, to show ourselves approved, a workman need not be ashamed, to rightly divide God's Word. There's only one way we can rightly divide it. We have to, first of all, keep it in context. What do I mean by that? In other words, you have to keep it, as the writer writes it, you've got to keep it in context with what he's talking about. The writer, who he's writing to, the time he's writing it in the period of time, and who he's writing it to, and who he's writing it for. You've got to keep this in context. It's very, very important. So now we see Gog's purpose for the invasion. God puts an evil thought in his end. Remember, one scripture, and I, I, I read it to you earlier at the first of Ezekiel chapter 38. He says, I will put a hook in your jaw and I will bring you to me. In other words, God, remember we talked about, and I'm a fisherman. When I hook a fish, I reel that fish in to me to take off the line. God is going to bring these countries to him so he can utterly destroy them. And we're going we're gonna to know why. And there's going to be some questions that I've been asked, and there's going to be questions, hopefully, that I can answer that I've been asked. And we're going to look at some of them questions on why would this happen? Why would a God do this? Uh, is it just in Bob Israel? Or is it the whole world? Well, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to answer them questions for you through biblical context, okay? Now, let's move on. And you're going to see a couple of these answers in the next few verses here, okay? We're going to look at God's purpose now for the invasion. In other words, the Lord God, his purpose for this all to transpire and to happen. Let's look at it. Verse 14. Therefore, son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel here, he says, prophesy and say to God, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, thou shalt know it. Now, he still calls Israel his people. Verse 15, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, great company, and a mighty army. Now, let's break that verse down. First of all, if you stood in Jerusalem, in the center of Jerusalem, and you put a compass in your hand, and it's going to point directly north. When it points directly north, it is the land of Russia. Now, that's not just enough, but that's a good point. But you can. how do we know that? Because all of Noah's sons, Ham, and we talked about this earlier, and, and Shem, and Japheth. And we know Japheth is who we come through, the lineage of the Gentiles. We know that Japheth and Noah settled in Russia. And we know that Gog and Magog are his descendants. We know that through scripture, through history also. Now, remember, I said before, prophecy can only be prophecy if, it's, if it can be tested and proven either true or false. Okay? Now, let's move on. What he's saying with this riding upon horses, remember, he wouldn't have been able to explain tanks. He wouldn't be able to explain uh, machine guns. He wouldn't be able to explain uh, battleships. Now, if you today were writing this, as God would instruct you to write it, as he did in the time of Ezekiel, how would you explain war? You would explain it with battleships or with tanks. You would explain it with uh, uh, machine guns. They used bow and arrows. They didn't have guns back then. Uh, they used uh, swords, uh, shields. That's how they explained war. And we know that 
through war. Now, let's move on. Verse 16 is very, very important here, okay? Let's look at verse 16. And thou shalt come upon against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So he tells us where they're going. First of all, they're going to Israel. And he says, when will it be? It shall be in the latter days. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's just later on in history. No, you're right, it is. But we can show this ties right in with Christ's return, okay? It's very important. We tie all that in. That's a thread in the Bible. And I can pull it in multiple scripture and show it. So let's move on. And I will bring thee against my land. Right here's one, two reasons why. And I'm going to define and break these reasons down later. Now, these are the two reasons. Well, well there's actually three here. But these are two listed in this first scripture right here. And I'm going to, like I said, we will revisit this scripture a little later. All right. Two reasons why God is going to do this. Bring them to him. Why? This was written in history, and God had planned a day, set, and time, and hour for this. That the heathen may know me. That's the first reason. That the heathen nations will know him. Right now, folks, there are very few people believe in God. Very few. I mean, do a poll. Go into one of these big cities and do a poll. Most of them laugh when you speak of, of God. Okay? He calls them heathens. Now, then he says, then when I will be sanctified in thee, O God, before thy eyes. In other words, he is going to be sanctified in his people. His people still are looking for him, the Jewish people. And all this is going to get tied in at other places. I'm not pulling this out. I'm tying this in with every other piece of uh, thread of prophecy. All right, so there's two reasons. He is going to... Bring Israel back to him. He is going to punish them and bring them back to him as his people. We'll find that more in other scripture to tie in with this battle. The second reason is the heathen nations will know him. That answers one question right there. Is this worldwide? Absolutely. This is worldwide. Okay. Um, people today... Don't believe God's Christ is returning. That's proof positive he's going to, according to Scripture. So, again, two reasons right here is listed. All right, now the third reason, let's look at it. Verse, verse 17. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he, in other words, God, this man, of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants in the prophets of Israel? which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring you against them. Now, in other words, the, the, the third reason is fulfillment of prophecies. Again, to show why does God give us prophecy? To prove he is the true God of the Bible. He says right here, fulfillment of prophecies. Now, give you some here that you can look at. I'm not going to get to all of these. But we will look at some of them. Isaiah chapter 10, 20 through 27, if you want to write that down. Uh, Isaiah 11, chapter 11, verse 4. Isaiah 14, 4 through 27. Isaiah 34, 1 through 17. Uh, Isaiah 36, uh, excuse me, 63, 1 through 6. Jeremiah 30, 1 through 11. Joel 3 and Micah 5, 3 through 15. Now we will look at some of these possibly most of them by the time I get completely through Daniel. But I'm giving you some right here. Now, we've seen God's purpose, and we've seen the Lord God's purpose. Okay? Both of them are directed by God. All right. Now, the next verses that we're going to look at will be verses 18 through 23. And in these verses, and I don't know that I've got enough time today to actually break them down, but I, I will do this much. Let's talk about, I've still got about 10 minutes. Let's talk about these next few verses. I'm not going to read them yet, but I'm going I'm to break some stuff down for you. 
God is going to destroy these armies that's coming against his land and his people with seven types of destructions. And they're listed here in verses 18 through 23. We're going to talk about them a little bit. And also there's going to be a remnant left when Christ breaks the clouds on his return with the saints, he will destroy that remnant. And we will see that remnant come over here in chapter 39. We'll see the remnant that's left. And he gives us a number of the remnant. And in, when you get to Revelation, it tells us that that remnant is what Christ will destroy. So God destroys, I'll say this, God destroys all but a sixth of this army. He leaves a sixth. When Christ returns with the saints, he will, he will destroy the sixth part that's left uh, by the brightness of his coming. And we'll read that as we get to it in Scripture. But let's talk about these destructions, okay? There's seven of them. And then when I read them, we'll, break, we'll get into them a little bit more in depth. The first one's going to be a great earthquake. Has God used earthquakes to deal with rebellious peoples in the past? Absolutely. I'm going to give you some scripture. You guys can go back and you guys can look at it. You can go to Numbers chapter 16. He used an earthquake to swallow up the rebellious people in the rebellion of Korah. Now, Korah was a man that about 250 men rebelled with him against Moses and Aaron over leadership. So God had Moses gather them together in an area. He opened the earth. He swallowed them up and he closed the earth back. So God does use earthquakes. And we're going to come to see that this earthquake, when we read about it, is not only in Israel, but it's worldwide. And we will break all that down when we get to it. The second way that God is going to destroy the, these armies is going to be sword against sword. What does that mean? That's friendly fire. All this chaos going on, they're going to turn around. All these different languages is over there. They're going to turn on each other. They're going to kill each other. All right, the third way God is going to destroy him was pestilence and blood. What is pestilence and blood? We know pestilence is disease and plagues with blood raining on them or falling on them. Now, guys, could you imagine all this happening at one time? There's going to be an overflowing rain. This rain's going to be so hard you can't see you can't hear, and it's not only going to hurt hitting you, it's going to have acid in it. And how do I know that? Because that will be your number seventh destruction. It's going to be mingled in with it. So it's going to be acid rain, and it's going to be torrential. The Bible tells us that. Now, let's move on. The fifth thing that's going to destruct or excuse me, that's going to destroy these armies, are great hailstones. We're going to see that in Scripture. Also, we know during this battle, you can go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. These hailstones, uh, most Bible scholars believe, are going to weigh over 100 pounds. Some Bibles say 117 pounds. So God's going to stone them. Has you used that prior? Absolutely. The sixth destructive force that's going to fall on them is going to be fire. Could you imagine it raining fire on your head? And of course the seventh is going to be brimstone. We know brimstone is sulfur and it will burn the skin. It will melt the skin. Could you imagine these seven destructive forces when these armies land on Israel, when they put their feet down on the land of Israel, God is going to utterly show them, these heathen nations, who's God. He's not only going to show these heathen nations, but he's going to show the Jewish people who he truly is. He's the Messiah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords that they crucified. Because why did they crucify him? Because they were expecting him to set his earthly kingdom up then. Thank God he didn't, and he gave us a chance, and we were grafted in, and thank the Lord for that today. So here's the seven destructions that we know that's going to happen. Now, 
I'm going to stop there today, and next Tuesday, please join me, and we will actually pick back up, and we will talk about this destructions that God is going to drop on Gog and his armies at the Battle of Armageddon. We will break these down. We'll talk about the remnant and how the remnant is tied in with Revelation. We will actually see the word remnant. Um, guys, we'll tie all this in. We'll even talk about uh, how I googled these, uh, this remnant and how many people that would be. Uh, we'll break all this down. We've still got to do that. I want to go through the time of Jacob's trouble with you guys and talk about the birth pains and what Jacob's trouble is. And we'll, I, I want to, I'm going to be, there's going to be some questions that I'm going to, and I know I've been asked, and I know if you guys are, are Bible students, you probably could have been asked the same. Uh, why does God pour out his wrath out upon the whole world in the end times? Why would God judge the whole world because of Israel's rebellion? Is it not just is it just Israel or is it the whole world that's judged? Guys, we're going we'll answer these questions through scripture. Again, thank you guys for joining in tonight. Please like and share so God's word gets out and invite someone else to join in, guys. And and I I'll, I'll say this. I believe we're living in the last days and I believe it's it's close. And I believe we can I believe you can see a lot of this unfolding today. Uh, again, thank everyone. Please, again, like and share. Everyone have a blessed and wonderful Monday night. And if nothing happens next Tuesday night, I'll be back online normal time. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.